Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixon. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, I don't know where to start today. (laughs) There's a lot going on. (laughs) Is there? (laughs) Well, there's really not a lot going on. Um, I mean, impeachment is definitely kind of the, the news is is obsessed with impeachment right now. The, the, The Republicans are kind of making, I think they finished making their case yesterday for like the defense or whatever. And if I'm not mistaken, today was supposed to be like questions. I guess they have like a question time where they can, and I haven't got to catch really any of that. So, because I pretty well came straight here. I heard uh, Rand Paul was making waves. Really? Yeah, he kept bringing up uh, Eric Cheramella. Oh, really? And the uh, Chief Justice um, Mm. kept telling him he couldn't. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to take a look. Yeah, see, like I said, I haven't heard anything from today. Yeah, that's a a bunch of malarkey anyway. Use Biden's word. (laughs) <laughs> I'd say it's mine first, but he's like 80 years older than me. <laughs> you um, think he takes preference over you? <laughs> yeah. President. President. No. He takes president over you? Pre- anyway. <laughs> no, go on and correct me, man. No. Precedent. Yes, there precedent. you go. <laughs> um, no, it, the... Okay, so it is part of the Constitution, like literally part of the Constitution that you get to face your accuser. Yeah. Um, and that applies to this as well. If well, you're going to call it a that's trial a, at all, I was going to say. I mean, if you're going to call this, like even a, the president gets to face his accuser. <laughs> face his accuser. I mean, it yeah. seems like that's that would be normal. I mean, it definitely mm-hmm. is in a normal court of law. Yeah. So. Well, and that's not what, um, like impeachment is a trial. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, I mean, the, that's not what whistleblower protections are about anyway. Yeah, it's not about like hiding their name and so forth. It's, you know, at least at a point where it's come to some kind of, um, you know, legal action. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like once you've hit like legal action status, it doesn't seem like in any situation, much less this particular situation, that you'd have a whole lot of protections as a whistleblower. Because once it hits the point where it's like going to a trial, Mm -hmm. it seems like you kind of have to come out at that point. Yeah. I mean, I would think, I mean, it should, my understanding was that it was there to protect you, like, if nothing came of it, and you still had to go back to work. Yeah, that's essentially it. Um, It's supposed to protect you from... um you know, essentially revenge, yeah, (laughs) retaliation, harassment, that kind of thing. It's not supposed to protect your identity. Yeah. Um, that was, which that can be, I mean, I can see protecting the identity, like if in the early stages of the, of an investigation, like, so the whole thing's going on and nobody really knows if anything's going to come of it during that portion. I can see, yeah, protect the guy's identity. Cause if he ends up having to go back, you don't want everybody to know who, like right. Initiated this whole problem. But once you hit the point where, okay, there's something here, and there's at that point, you kind of have to come out. <laughs> at the point that you're in a Senate trial? Yeah. And, and that, I think this rises to that level. <laughs> yeah. I, so. I would agree. Um, I am, you know, the first to say the president isn't anything special. Like, yeah. he doesn't get any special treatment, but that includes it going the other way. Like, right. he also gets to face his <laughs> accuser. Yeah. Um, he is uh, subject to the same constitutional protections as the rest of us oh absolutely so So. Um, it's it's the whole deal is just a mess anyway i mean like i say i've I've watched some of the defense for the republicans and it's been all right but the the democrats are just grasping at straws there's even if you take everything they say as 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 for what for what they claim it is i still don't see a crime and you still have the problem of convincing the american people that there's a crime there because they don't have to convince the American. Well, no, people. you don't have to, but you do because the because this isn't going to go all the way through the Senate. I mean, Trump isn't re- being going to be removed from office, so you end up with the scenario of okay, so we're going to have to beat him at the ballot box. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't. You're not making a very strong case for that. Yeah. Well, what about the question of witnesses? I mean, I'm all for witnesses. I think it'll be plenty entertaining if they bring witnesses in. Yeah. But I mean, 
you know, I don't I don't think they're going to. I have the bees, Bolton and the Bidens. Yeah. I mean, I think it'd be fun to have the Bidens up there. I yeah. think Bolton's just got an axe to grind. Yeah. Well, that's the weird trade-off. And the truth is that the man's on tape saying um, that he uh, thinks it's perfectly acceptable to lie to the American people in order to achieve your goals. <laughs> um, and we're pretty confident about what his goals are. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that this would qualify. Um, so I, you can't take anything that that guy says as uh, as fact. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's not like you can take anything the Biden say as fact either. But that's this weird um, rock in a hard place that the Democrats are between. Like, OK, they want to call Bolton up there because they think they'll get something useful, which I don't think they will. But they think that they do. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the trade off is, well, you can call Bolton if we can call Hunter Biden. Yeah. Well, they don't want him to sit up in front of everybody yeah, and answer questions either. That's the last thing they want. Um, yeah. That's not going to help their situation any. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I don't see that. I, this is all just kind of a joke anyway. Truth is, if no witnesses come up there, it's not a real trial as far as I'm concerned. It was a complete yeah. waste of time. And if witnesses do come up, the people that want to get something out of it are not going to get what they want. Neither side's going to end up with a real win. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is, uh, yeah, um, that's the truth. This is like this, uh, kind of like this internecine conflict, right? Where there's damage being done to both sides. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's really coming out of this ahead. Yeah. Um, although if anybody comes out ahead at this point, it looks to me like it's going to be Trump, um, just yeah. because the, the whole thing's so absurd. And I can't believe we spent this much time on it because. I find it incredibly boring and a complete waste of time. Oh, it, like I said before, don't listen to it while you're going down the road. You will fall asleep behind the wheel, man. <laughs> well, and here's the other thing, too, is that you say the news is full of it. Yeah, I'm sure that the news is full of it, but I imagine that four out of five Americans could not care less. Oh, I'd agree with that. And so it becomes more of a waste of time to to spend time on it on our podcast. Oh, I agree. I, I think. Yeah. Um, now... Something that's related to the impeachment that I do think is probably worthwhile to discuss is just the Ukraine issue in general. Okay. Um, I, I, there's a there's quite a history of our involvement there, and of course, you know, it goes back to the fall of the Soviet Union um, in the early '90s, and uh, when all the various Soviet republics split off and became their own states, um, and uh, you know, so that was thirty ish years ago. Yeah. Um, most of the republics, they had trouble recovering. Like, everybody had trouble recovering in the post-Soviet era, the post-communist or post-socialist, however you want to look <laughs> at it, um, era. I mean, truth, truthfully, socialist, I guess. Yeah. Um, because they were all, like, began their statehood in absolute economic crisis, right? <laughs> right. Like every single one of them. Um, and without a history of uh, a free market enterprise, like the only people that really knew how to operate within a free market were the black market people. It was all the, you know, organized crime and so forth that were able to adapt most quickly because that was the only market that was a free market. So they basically kind of came in and like took over pretty much. Yeah, just about everything. Yeah. Um, and of course, then there was the the West's uh, introduction of you know, what they call the, um, you know, shock therapy capitalism, um, where they just, they pieced apart all of the, um, the state um, industries and, you know, privatized them all in various ways. And the people that were best connected um, got the most out of it. That's how this, you know, this whole oligarchy formed in say, the first place. Yeah, that's kind of how it works in, under that type of system anyway, right? Well, mm. yes and no. I mean, I mean, in a true socialist system, that it wouldn't but well, yeah but that's um, not but that's never the way it works though no like, no I, I mean, mean there were there were preferred people yeah. um having connections mattered uh you certainly lived a better life if you knew the right people and were and they proved kinda, your loyalty to the party and all that yeah. kind of stuff well i mean and everything kind of works on under the table money right i mean don't and that's kind of how you get things done, uh, not at right? First, <laughs> well, yeah, well, not, obviously not at first, but that's um, where you end up, though. Yeah, I, I think that that's almost certainly true. Yeah. I mean, I didn't live there. Oh yeah, well, really obviously know. me either. So. Um, I mean, just... I, based on what I read and so forth, though, yeah, it, it seems yeah. like it, there was. Um, well, I think that what it comes down to is that the stronger the state, um, the more corrupt. Yeah, because it has so much influence over 
you know, people's fortunes, that it incentivizes people to to bribe the state to get the best that they can. To get get what they need or yeah. want, yeah. Um, so as far as the U.S. involvement, like um, in 2004... So well, I don't know where do you where do you want to start with this? <laughs> I don't I, know, it, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, I mean, start from the fall of the Iron Curtain, man. Well, we just did. I mean, okay, there's, well, a, there's was, a lot yeah. to kind of gloss over, I, yeah. I think, for that because it it doesn't relate to like the current Situation. discussion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it does to some degree because one thing leads to another, yeah. but. Um, I think history that we can starts skip in 1979. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we can skip a lot of that. I mean, okay. Let me actually start with um, start with uh, this quote from David Hendrickson. Okay. Um, he said, uh, "We seniors, the 60 plus set, have had too many hopes busted to accept the fairy tale vision whereby a basically good people elects basically good leaders all around the world." Experience teaches, rather, that the grandest thing in democratic politics is the forbearance of voters under an obnoxious and detestable ruler. There's something admirable in patiently waiting a prescribed limit to throw the bastards out. What is even better is the willingness of the selfsame bastards to depart in peace, as Yanukovych once did previously. It's all done according to rules. And I, I just thought that was kind of an insightful look at democracy, honestly, <laughs> yeah, especially right? given our current situation, right? No like joke. that we all sit here and we just like grin and bear it until mm. that guy's done and we can finally get rid of him and get the next ass, <laughs> you know, in there. Yeah. Um, and then do it again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but we following the rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, especially um, us as libertarians, because, I mean, we never get our guy. At least if you have a side like a Democrat or a Republican, like... Well, and, you know, that discussion leads to the situation that we had in 2014 and or that Ukraine had in 2014 yeah. um, or into 2013, I guess, is when it really started. Uh, they didn't wait that prescribed limit. Um, really? It wasn't long before they were going to have another election, but they didn't. They didn't wait. They, they didn't wait that long. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and he says that like Yanukovych had done previously that was the um, president that was in office in 2014 when the coup occurred yeah. um and the reason he said had done previously is because yanukovych was elected in 2010 uh but in 2004 there was another election where he ran um and he lost and he moved on yeah uh, you know he tried again six years later when they had another presidential election yeah um and he won that time Nice. And he actually won that time. Yeah. I mean, there really isn't a lot of question about whether the you know ballots were stuffed or anything like that. I mean, yeah. international Seemed observers, like everybody up, involved, up and up. Yeah. yeah, said that it was a free and fair election. Yeah. Um, but what happened in in 2014 um, is, and you may remember all this time where uh, you had McCain and um, uh, Lindsey Graham and John Kerry. And uh, Joe Biden as the vice president, um, the under whatever, the assistant secretary of state for European affairs or whatever her title was, uh, Victoria Newland. Oh, Newland, um, yeah. Yes, all out there. I mean, these are these are big players in the U.S. government, and they were out there encouraging um, protests uh, against Viktor Yanukovych. In, yeah, I do remember in that. Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and we ended up backing. Uh, I mean. Certainly the U.S. was involved in the coup, and uh, and certainly the U.S. was involved in the aftermath of the coup. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you have the two parties, though, that, well, not the two parties, but among the parties that we supported, that the U.S. supported, um, that uh, that overthrew the existing Yanukovych government, um, was the uh, the Freedom Party, Svoboda. Uh, Svoboda, this is hard to say. <laughs> SV yeah. together at the beginning of a word is hard to say. Svoboda um, and the right sector, Pravi sector. Okay. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing both of those, but whatever. Okay. Um, after the fall of Yanukovych, uh, they, you know, they took over portions of the government. Um, now, these guys, though, they're neo-Nazis, like actual neo-Nazis. Actual li- yeah. neo-Nazis. Um, though, yeah. They're literally descendants of Nazi sympathizers or, or Nazi allies in Ukraine that fought against the Russians in World War II. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is the people that we were supporting. And it creates a bunch of problems because the Russians don't trust them, right? <laughs> and they don't like the Russians. So um, it, it created this new antagonism 
between Russia and the Ukraine as if it there wasn't some yeah. kind of antagonism already. Yeah. Um, but uh, and what prompted this whole thing um, was this was just after uh, Yanukovych had rejected the EU's um, bid to like it, to be a exclusive trading partner. Essentially, that was the problem. Yeah. Um, it was a as an economic deal, but it forbade um, the Ukrainians from dealing with the Russians. Like it isolated them from Russia. And Yanukovych is a Russian speaking um, president. He was um, aligned in both directions. Yeah. And this is something that could have been done in both directions. Like it absolutely, things would have turned out better if you'd just let him deal with the Russians and deal with the EU. Yeah. It probably, <laughs> it, it could have been a nice bridge between Russia and the EU. Yeah. Um, but part of the deal with the EU uh, was that they wouldn't deal with the Russians anymore. And so he just uh, decided that that wasn't a good deal all in all. I mean, they get a bunch of energy from Russia, et cetera. So yeah. um, he rejected the EU deal and made a deal with the Russians. And it was after that that this coup occurred, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the uh, the EU was in support of the coup because they wanted the economic relations with Ukraine. Yeah. Um, Got to get that oil. Natural yeah, gas, natural. I think, mostly in this case. But Got to get that natural gas. Yes, yeah, energy, energy, right? <laughs> yep. Um, and, but the, the government that they wanted to set up after the coup, uh, they were... Um, supporting a different party. It was like the UDAR or something like that. It was a more moderate party that kind of leaned both ways uh, because they wanted to keep the Russians content. Around, yeah. 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 They didn't um, want to shoo them just straight out because then that would cause more problems. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, as you recall, it was later leaked um, that this Victoria Newland's call uh, where she was talking with the ambassador of the Ukraine at the time, Jeffrey uh, Pyatt, it, it. Okay, I've I've heard this call. I heard. I think did that just come out like this week or recently? Oh no, or was it a while it was, back? It came out in 2014. Did it really? Oh yeah. Well, this well, was I like just, a, I heard that this week somewhere. That was the first time you'd heard it. Yeah, it was the first oh, time well. I had heard it. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is the famous F the EU call, right? Yeah, like the, yeah, yeah. Um, That's the one. I definitely. I just heard that this week. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> she and the ambassador to Ukraine are the, just like casually discussing who they're going to put in government after this coup happens. This uh, yeah. the call occurred a couple of weeks before the coup. Oh, Oh, wow. So they're already discussing really? like who they're going to put in power, wow. um, and uh, of course they uh, they support um, Arseny Yatsenyuk, who did become uh, the um, the PM after the coup. I mean, or president, whatever. Anyway, we filled all those positions, right? And yeah. uh, and they, you know, like I said, the EU supported the coup, but wanted to keep a, a different party in. Um, so the Russians would remain reasonably content and not feel too threatened. Um, now, that party ended up not being a part of the the uh, transitional government at all. Oh, really? uh, you know, and so as Newland said, uh, F the EU and apparently Russia too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they supported these groups that ended up taking over a lot of the, uh, you know, these neo-Nazi groups that ended up taking over a lot of the minister's positions, in, which was mostly like security and law enforcement type oh, roles. Wow. All right. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the Crimeans, then you get this other part, right? So we're still sanctioning Russia for invading the Crimea, yeah. which I guess technically they did. Um, however, yeah. like the way it's presented and the way it actually happened are very different things. So the, the Crimeans initiated a secession movement after the Yanukovych government was overthrown. Um, this is again, a more, uh, Russian leaning group. It's, it's mostly ethnic Russian, um, Russian speaking group. Um, and, uh, the, the Crimea, um, has belonged to Russia since the rule of Catherine the great, like 200 years ago. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, they, she bought it off the Turks or something. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so not only has it, it like it been a part of Russia for a long period of time, it only became a part of the Ukraine in the 1950s, um, when uh, Nikita Khrushchev gave it to him as a political favor for some support or something like that, but it was it was essentially meaningless because they were all Soviet Union <laughs> republics. They like, they weren't yeah. actually independent, so it was. I mean, it was just kind of on paper. Yeah, yeah. you know, it didn't kind didn't of mean a anything. ceremonial thing, not like a. Yeah, um, and but of course, after the Soviet Union dissolved, 
it yeah. mattered again. Yeah. But it didn't matter so much because the Crimeans were happy to keep the Russian Navy at Sevastopol, which is a big, uh, this is an important thing for Russia. It would be their only warm water port. Oh, okay. Um, so all their other ports, I guess, essentially freeze from time to time. <laughs> it's hard to move things in and out of. Icebergs floating around. Yeah. Um, so what happens when you're in the Arctic Circle, I guess. Yeah. Uh, when you're, the great majority of your coastline is above the Arctic Circle. Right. right. Um, so, and just to make it more complete, as far as the Crimean's parent desires, um, they voted in a referendum uh, affirming their desire to secede, fr- to secede from the Ukraine. And, um, well, they wanted to become independent, but they would rather lean Russian than yeah. Ukrainian. Um, well, that's not what you hear in the media at all, though. All you hear is, like, tanks and, like, Russia just rolled in and took it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, force. <laughs> and think about how strange it is to say that um, that we support the, uh, the neo-Nazis overthrowing the duly elected government of Ukraine and taking over, um, but we don't support the Crimeans joining the Russians after voting uh, heavily in a referendum to do to just that. To do so, yeah. Yeah. That's just insane. So are we pro-democracy or not? Yeah. It's hard to say. Well, only it what, depend- yeah. I was going to say, it depends on what where the leanings are, yeah. <laughs> what we're getting out of it. And the, the, you know, the more of this new form of irony, which is uh, you uh, you say of others what you are yourself, that, yes. that whole thing, um, is that John Kerry at the time said in the 21st century, don't just invade a country on a completely trumped up pretext. <laughs> Like, this is literally, you know, 12 years after we went into um, Iraq. Iraq. I mean, so. Exactly. Um, On a completely trumped up (laughs) pretext. (laughs) Yep. Uh, So, again, it's that lack of self awareness that is just kind of amazing. Um, But as far as the Crimeans and the, the eastern parts of Ukraine in general, wanting to ally with the Russians. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons for it. Like I said, they're mostly ethnically Russian. I mean, the Ukraine is a weird place anyway because it's kind of divided um, between a, uh, a more Western-leaning um, population that's not ethnically Russian um, and a more uh, Russian-leaning population that is ethnically Russian and speaks Russian instead of Ukrainian, or, well, probably both, but, yeah. you know. Um, and, uh, of course, we have the answer to that, like, well, let them choose their own fates, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, um, as Crimea did, but we don't approve yeah. of that one. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S., I mean, you mean. We, yeah, we approve of it just fine. <laughs> yeah, um, the U.S. does not. <laughs> so uh, after the, the overthrow of the Yanukovych government, the, this more Western-leaning um, government that took over, um, that is, like, they literally formed... Well, okay. Um, I guess first uh, they did some things that to try and isolate the the Russian regions, the Russian leaning regions, um, to punish them or uh, to try and ensure their um, compliance. Um, which you know we can talk about that kind of thing some more when we get to the other thing that we want to talk about tonight. But yeah. um, they uh, they cut off banking and other financial services from the Donbass regions, um, and they. The Donbass, like they couldn't purchase things. Really, like they had no access to financial services. Yeah, um, just like froze all their money. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, like we're doing to Iran. Yeah, yeah, uh, same type thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, the, you know, these places needed relief, and they were supplied by Russia. Um, and the reason that they had to come from Russia is because these people couldn't move into other areas of Ukraine because at the same time. Um, the, the government was, or at least these neo-Nazi groups had formed like literal death squads that were going around killing ethnic Russians. And so they risked trying to cleanse the area. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, just trying to move into another area of the Ukraine, uh, could mean that they would have run-ins with these, with With these these groups. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so like we're, we're into this weird situation where, like you have to wonder. So uh, we've said over and over again, um, Russia isn't invading the Ukraine. They're not rolling across Ukraine, and you know they'll be in Germany next week or whatever. It's not. It's <laughs> yeah. not like that at all. Um, they are providing support uh, to the um, 
Ukrainian resistance, the the Russian speaking Ukrainian resistance in eastern Russia, um, and of course they have taken control of Crimea uh, without a shot fired. I mean, they they didn't meet any resistance. Yeah, yeah, they were there. welcomed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, you know that's it, it's not they're not going anywhere that they haven't been invited essentially by the people that live there. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm what I'm trying to get at. And so if it's the US's responsibility to protect these Ukrainian Nazis halfway around the world, um, how then can it not be the Russian responsibility to protect the ethnic Russians like literally right across their border? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean like absolutely. who has <laughs> you know, I, I would who say Who has that, more skin in the game here? Yeah, exactly. I mean this yeah. is definitely their sphere of influence. Yeah. Um and, of course, all this happened just 10 years after the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which was also aided by the U.S. government. This is that, um, you know, what was happening in 2004 um, that put the president, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, um, who had been a central banker, and the prime minister, Yulia Tymoshenko, um, who's the gas princess, and, and don't be fooled, like her Princess Leia-styled hair uh, does not actually mean she's a hero in the story. <laughs> um, they put those people in in power, uh, you know, with Western support, mm -hmm. and those people turned out not to be the liberal Democrats that that Western media was proclaiming them to be. Um, they destroyed the Ukrainian economy, and uh, when Poroshenko uh, ran in that election in two thousand four. Um, you know, he lost to these people after they were getting Western support. And there's some yeah. question. I mean, like it was, there were questions about that election. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, then he, you know, he ran again in 2010 and won in an undisputably fair election. Yeah. And it was a, it was a real rejection of what had occurred in the orange revolution. Right. Yeah. Like they said, okay, well we, we tried this. It, it, it did, didn't work didn't out. Didn't work, yeah. Um, and one of the big differences between uh, um, Tymoshenko and uh, Yushchenko uh, was that Yushchenko was opposed to joining NATO, and Tymoshenko was. Uh, yeah. Yushchenko didn't make it to the election. Um, he got uh, less than five percent of the vote in the early rounds. Like he didn't, he didn't go anywhere <laughs> yeah. in two thousand ten. Yeah. Um, when he ran for re-election. Wow. Um, People and then, were tired of that. Yeah. Uh, so Tymoshenko was still in it, and it was close between her and Yanukovych, or yeah. reasonably close. Uh, they also have, like we do in the Libertarian Party, they have none of the above as an option on their ballots. Oh, nice. I love that. <laughs> um, and it, none of the above got something like 5 or 6% of the vote. We should have that in the in the national election. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that right now that's the Libertarian Party vote. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we don't want any of these guys, so we'll just yeah. vote for. This is a uh, protest. There's another right. guy on this ballot. I'll vote for that person. Yeah. Um. So, anyway, um, that's essentially the story of the Ukraine, and why does it matter in the uh, in the context of impeachment? Is that in 2004, when the U.S. government was so heavily involved in, or 2014, excuse me, when yeah. the U.S. government was so heavily involved in the overthrow. Um, of the elected president, um, you know, Joe Biden was brought in, you know, like I said, we already have on tape Victoria Newland and the uh, American ambassador to the Ukraine talking about who was going to be placed in power. And that's who got placed in power yeah. um, there. Uh, we had McCain and um, Graham and all these guys out there like handing out food to to the protesters before the actual coup occurred. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, Victoria Newland says in her phone call, well, we'll bring in, uh, Joe Biden to seal this thing together and, and so forth. Yeah. And he does. Um, yeah. and so right after that, then his son is appointed to the board of Burisma. Uh, this is at a time when, um, and we're just supposed to accept that that's just like a coincidence. Yeah. I mean, I, that's basically what the Democrats are assuming here. Well, I mean, that can't possibly be true. Well, obviously um, it's not. I mean, and nobody believes that's true on either side of the aisle. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, Hunter Boy Biden was appointed to this board at Burisma. It's the largest private energy company in Ukraine. Um, and Hunter Biden can't speak Ukrainian, and he has no... Uh, no experience in the industry. 
Yeah. Um, and he was getting paid a million dollars a year to sit on that board. To do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and at the same time, um, they employed some lobbyists. Uh, Burisma employed some lobbyists um, that are connected to uh, John Kerry. Yeah. Um, one of them was the um, John Kerry when he was a senator. It was his chief of staff, David Leiter. Yeah. It's a name you might recognize. That sounds familiar, um, yeah. And uh, there was another guy um, that they hired to lobby who was uh, um, John Kerry's uh, campaign or a campaign advisor on the 2004 um, John Kerry presidential campaign. Yeah. Um, his name is uh, Devin Archer. Okay. All right. And both uh, Devin Archer and Hunter Biden had worked with, um, they, well, I say worked with, they had been business partners of John Kerry's son in law. Um, Christopher Hines. Ah, that name sounds familiar. All right. So, you know, all these people are connected to very high ranking members, like literally the secretary of state and the vice president of the United States <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Um, and there was no reason other than that connection really for them to for them have to been be involved. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So. Um, so, you know, maybe there wasn't outright corruption, but there's certainly something fishy involved. I mean, it, yeah. they were certainly brought in because of their influence with the U.S. government, or at least their perceived influence with the U.S. government. Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. Um, whether they actually had that influence or not is another question. Um, but, you know, that's... that's yeah. It's certainly worth looking into, does, I think. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. it definitely doesn't pass the smell test. Right. <laughs> and as you'll also recall, uh, so Burisma was under investigation um, at one point here, and uh, Biden openly bragged about directly threatening President Poroshenko at the time um, to uh, and uh, the prime minister that we'd placed, uh, Yatsenyuk, yeah. Arseniy Yatsenyuk, um, with withholding a billion dollars in, in a foreign aid loan um, if they didn't fire the prosecutor that was investigating Burisma. Yeah. And they did. And then they did, yeah. yeah. Now, doesn't that scenario sound a little familiar? Yeah. It sounds like I've heard about an impeachment trial that involved the same type thing. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, it, the whole thing is so absurd. But here's the, the to me, this is the frightening. And the, so that's how it connects to the impeachment. And that's why they don't want to bring Hunter Biden up there. Oh, yeah, because um, this I, stuff's going to start coming out. Yeah. I mean, I find it strange that they would use this particular um, event, this uh, phone call with Ukraine, where he, well, where they claim he You're threatened about to withhold the perfect aid. perfect phone call? Yeah. <laughs> the absolutely perfect phone call? Well, I mean, there's certainly. All right. It, the claim is just wrong, right? Yeah. Like the claim that's being made is just a lie. Yeah. Um that he was threatening to withhold uh this foreign aid money um if he didn't promise to uh, uh, announce that he was investigating yeah. the Bidens. And there was a bunch of talk about corruption in that um in that yeah. phone call. Oh, that, uh, absolutely. the Bidens come up with kind of an after like an afterthought. Yeah, that like was kind of just kind of at the thrown end in and, as yeah. an aside or something. Yeah. Um but the I think the salient points are that um they got the aid. Yeah. First off, they they actually did receive the aid. Um the aid was never mentioned in the phone call and in fact they weren't even aware that the aid was being withheld. Yeah. Um that uh, the discussion of the investigation, there never was a public announcement of an investigation. So, you know, what was asked for was never done either. Um, and that the people involved in Ukraine didn't feel pressured in any way. Yeah. <laughs> so so what's the real charge? Here? <laughs> yeah. It makes you... And, the, you know, the of course, the other question or that we brought up last week, I think, is that if, Vi if Biden wasn't running for president, yeah. it would be a non-issue entirely. Yeah. Like exactly. if it had just been some, you know, wealthy American citizen, there would be no question about this. Well, no, and I, so the, then it, the next question comes up, like if Biden drops out of the race, if, he, if his poll numbers just plummet and yeah. he drops out of the race, is it still an issue? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, the it's whole thing question. seems to be done with the assumption that Biden's going to be the presidential candidate for the yeah. for the Democrats. And I'm sure that that's what they want. I don't know if they're going to get that. Yeah, I, I think I, they will. But. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's going to be him or Clinton. Well, well yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm telling you, it's starting to look more and more like Bernie might be the man. I don't think it's going to happen. 
Um, and I hope it doesn't because I, I like I say, I don't know. I, I say I hope it doesn't. It might would be good to kind of have a, you know, we'll really have to talk about socialism if that happens as yeah. a country. Yeah. And that may not be the worst conversation for us to have. No. Um, I mean, I see that point. Uh, I think... <laughs> I, unfortunately, I think that we might lose that discussion. I don't well, think that people really understand what it is enough to to and that, that have is, a discussion. That about is it. true, and I mean, it, even if we have that discussion, it's not going to be the way me and you would have that discussion. Yeah. It well, would, even if they set it up as a socialism versus capitalism kind of thing, do we want uh, Trump's type of government to be associated with capitalism? Well, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's not like me and you having a. Co- conversation over true capitalism versus socialism it's going to be like the cronyism type capitalism we have now Mm -hmm. which isn't actually capitalism yeah (laughs) so i mean it's i mean you make a fair point (laughs) well um the the concern that i had though or like what i wanted to bring up about the 2014 issues is that we the west in general and the u.s in particular so brazenly um created a conflict with the with the russia yeah um and it, it just it just amazes me well and in a nuclear age that we would so openly do that yeah. um i mean well and still do it now i mean we're, oh yeah we're i mean we're we're doing stuff right now that's just as equally as bad yeah in, in regard to russia yeah it's this weird no fear attitude about it that i just don't understand and there's the whole issue of nato expansion too which i think is a, a really important part of this i mean that was the real concern of the russians is that the that ukraine would be absorbed into nato yeah. um and part of that agreement with the eu that that um that he rejected that kind of triggered this coup anyway um was that they would be incorporated into the EU security or defense organization or whatever. Really? Um, yeah, and that was the thing the, that the Russians had a real problem with. And so you have this... There's a reason for Russia to be concerned. Yeah. Um, and actually, like, probably now is as good a time as any to uh, insert this clip. Um, this is an old uh, White House... Um, press briefing or whatever they call them. And uh, the two people you're going to hear talking, the person asking the questions is going to be uh, Matt Lee. Um, he's the reporter. He's fantastic. Hadn't heard his name in a while, but he was always very, he didn't put up with any, um, any BS. Side like stepping. he, yeah, he really pushed to get answers to questions and he challenged them. And I, I really appreciate that, which may be why we haven't heard from him in a while. Um, <laughs> And then the uh, the person that he's asking the questions of is uh, John Kirby. That was Admiral John Kirby. He was the White House spokesperson, uh, well, one of the White House spokespeople during the Obama administration. Um, and and actually, I want to – okay, so uh, No Agenda calls those people spokes holes. Yeah. And I like the sound of that. You know, it rolls off the tongue. It, it sounds good. Um, but, uh, Will Grigg calls them spokes liars. And I think that's a more descriptive term. Yeah. I'm not sure which one I want to use. Some more accurate. I like sp- spokes liars. Spokes liars. <laughs> spokes liars. All right. So, yeah. uh, John Kirby is the, uh, the white house spokes liar. Right. Um, and he tries to sidestep all these, these questions about, you know, why Russia might be concerned about the expansion of NATO and so forth. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll just throw, we'll throw that in here right about here. And then we'll pick up this discussion after the clip. He also used the phrase that its army, meaning Russia's army, on NATO's doorstep. Um, why is that? Is, is it not logical to look at this and say the reason that the Russian army is on NATO, uh, the, the Russian army is at NATO's doorstep, is because NATO has expanded rather than the, the Russians expanding? That, in other words, NATO has moved closer to Russia rather than Russia moving closer to NATO. Is that not an accurate? way to look at this? I think that's the way President Putin probably looks at it. It's certainly not the way that we look at it. You don't you don't think that NATO has expanded eastward toward Russia? NATO has expanded and and the expansion has been a good thing for So the reason that the Russian army is at NATO's doorstep is not the fault of the Russian army, not the it's not the Russian army that's done it. It's NATO has moved closer to move east. I'm pretty sure it wasn't NATO who was ordering you know, upwards of 15 battalion tactical groups to within 10 kilometers of the border with Ukraine. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't NATO 
who put little green men inside Ukraine to destabilize okay. Eastern well, I'm states. I'm pretty sure that Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So unless that's changed, it's not, it's not okay. changed. But I'm so, pretty sure the movement by Russia is has Russia's NATO, decision. Has, if NATO has moved east, the reason that the Russian army is closer or on NATO's doorstep is because NATO moved. Not NATO is not an, an anti-Russia alliance. NATO is a security alliance. Unfortunately, for 50 years, it was an anti-Soviet alliance. So Where's do you not Soviet understand it? Now? So do you not understand how, or can you not even see? how the Russians would perceive it as a, as a threat. And the fact that it keeps getting closer to their border while their troops, I mean, the, the places where their troops are, you say their troops are and may, may have been in Ukraine and Georgia, are not NATO members. All right. Well, one thing that I want to point out here, too, um, is that when he, uh, John Kirby's talking about, um, you know, Russia moving units within 15 kilometers of the Ukraine border, uh, he's talking about them moving units Still inside Russia, inside like their within border. their own borders. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, they're on the they're on their side of that. <laughs> yeah, how provocative. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, so here's the issue: it, the uh, NATO has expanded far past what it was supposed to. Uh, the Bush the Elder promised um, that NATO would not move east after the German reunification, but since then, and we talked about this before, since then it's absorbed nine of the Warsaw. Pact nations and three former Soviet republics. Oh, yeah. All right, um, and so you have this uh, expansion of NATO really right up to the borders of Russia, um, and you have uh, the U.S.'s violation of the um, um, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty by placing all these multi-purpose missile batteries in surrounding countries like Turkey. Um, the U.S. actually withdrew from the ballistic uh, ballistic missile treaty. Is that what it was called in 2002? Um, and, uh, you know, you have additional attempts to incorporate, incorporate more Soviet states um, into the West and against Russia like Ukraine, uh, which is why this is such a uh, an important point here, like a, a place where it might make sense that Putin would say, yeah, this is a line that you this, really this can't is, cross. This is a bridge too far. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so then I, I came across this quote by Richard Sakwa that I wanted to throw in here because I thought it was funny. Um, and so he was saying that uh, NATO exists to manage the risks created by its own existence. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know. um, but, you know, this this is a reasonable concern for Russia. And as, that, as Matt Lee pointed out, the purpose of NATO, the existence of NATO, was to... Um, to defend against the Soviet Union. Now, uh, of course, Kirby tries to turn it around and say, well, where's the Soviet Union now? But, I mean, okay. it, it is reasonable that Russia would consider that still an affront. Oh, absolutely. Um, especially since they haven't been, uh, like, if they had been incorporated into NATO, that would be one thing. Yeah. Um, but they haven't. They've been left on the outside and kind of isolated by NATO. Yeah. I mean, if you incorporated them into the into NATO, like, what would be the point of NATO then? Uh, <laughs> like, it would have no point at all. Defend against China? Yeah, maybe. Or, but honestly, I mean, it, it might actually protect against like a nuclear war because, like, yeah, everybody's we, a part of it. We're all a part of this yeah. thing now. So well, and then I mean, you could use it to protect against the less developed states, the Middle East and Africa. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I'm, I can't think of the name of the book. Um, the author's like Barnum or something like that. Uh, the Pentagon's new map. That's what it was called. Oh, okay. I've um, heard of that. Which is, uh, I think it's an important book to read because it's certainly a big part of the Washington establishment's idea of the purpose of their foreign policy. Yeah. Um, it, he, the guy actually makes some good points in it too, but it's so misguided in so many ways. But his idea of the core and the gap, um, I think is reasonable where, you know, you have these, core developed countries that are, you know, um, integrated in a lot of ways. And so there's less likely that's the whole, um, you know, where, um, goods cross borders, soldiers don't, yeah. um, you know, they're integrated, they are dependent on each other to some degree. Um, there's very little chance of war between them. Yeah. Um, and then you have the gap countries that, that have refused essentially to integrate, um, with the rest of the world and uh, try to maintain this isolationist perspective and yeah, and so forth. I, I, I don't think that that's a completely useless tool to look at the world. And so there you go. Uh, that could be another purpose of NATO, that you know, mm. NATO would be encircling these gap countries 
and help defend each other against uh, spillover violence from these places that just haven't developed in the same way. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I still don't think that that's useful either, but that, I mean, that's something. <laughs> At least there's an argument there, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess that's essentially it. The, the point is that, first off, Russia and Putin aren't the bad guy that they've been made out to be. Um, that it seems to me that in a lot of ways their actions are a legitimate reaction to the the actions of the Western countries around them. Yeah. Um, that as you start to encroach on them, I mean, it's the same kind of thing of that you've seen that meme with Iran with all the U.S. bases marked around yeah. it and say, you know, <laughs> well, if they didn't want to fight, they shouldn't have put their country, their country in the middle next of to all, all of our bases, bases. right? <laughs> I mean, it's the same kind of thing that we're doing with Russia. We've yeah. continued to move closer and closer to them with an alliance that was initially built to check their power. Yeah. Um, and even though the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, I mean, it's very clear in the perceptions of a lot of people in the West, a lot of people in government in the in the West, there's not any difference between Russia and the Soviet Union. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they don't act that way at all. Yeah. Um, and it kind of makes you ask the question, like, what, what do they want Russia to do? Like, what could Russia do to, like, appease us or whatever because i mean it just seems like we're the ones that are the aggressors here so yeah i, I, I mean, think there's some truth to that. And, and i don't know like i say i just it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me like yeah. what what do we really expect them to do i mean they've shown more restraint than we would well yeah i agree with that too i and you know, Kirby says in that clip, and there's so many other clips where he says essentially the same thing, is that um, NATO is and always has been a defensive alliance. There's no reason that they should feel threatened by this defensive alliance that keeps moving closer and closer to them with their weapons. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, seriously, guys? <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it seems like if you if the shoe were on the other foot, oh. just, you know, try and approach it with some empathy and you can see why Russia well, might feel the, the threatened. The shoe has been on the other foot. The Cuban Missile Crisis. That's man. true. I mean, we we know how we would react to this. Mm -hmm. Like we know. Yeah. Or it, to as in the Ukraine example, um, what if Russia was uh, trying to create closer and closer ties with Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> and then you know, buddy up enough to uh, get but, their own supporters in power there, and maybe yeah. start moving. Start um, moving missile silos over. Yeah. Like, I mean, you think we wouldn't have a problem with that? So, nah, nah, we're nah, we're yeah, totally it's, passive it's, about that well, kind yeah, of. It's, it's it's all defensive anyway, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, I've been told that you can't um, use uh, sarcasm on podcasts because nobody can see your face. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I've been told. Ah, okay. Have to bear that in mind. I, maybe you just have to announce it afterwards. Ah, that was sarcasm. that was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Not entirely related, but somewhat related, tangentially related, we'll say, yeah. um, is the other thing that I wanted to talk about since we didn't really have any domestic news worthy of news yeah. um, to discuss is uh, the uh, the Trump unveiled his uh, Middle East peace plan, which was now he never said this. It was dubbed by others as the deal of the century. Deal of the um, century. And uh, his son-in-law, his name I can't ever remember. Kushner. 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 Jared Kushner. Yeah. Um, so Jared Kushner has been working on this like forever. Yeah. And there was a time that the Palestinians were involved until it became clear that the peace plan was going to be everything that the Israelis wanted and nothing that the Palestinians wanted. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there, I, I suspect if there hasn't been, there will be. Um, a backla backlash in the media about how the Palestinians just refused a deal um, and that they, you know, they won't accept anything that's put in front of them. And I mean, this is how this kind of thing has been presented in the past. Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, to give like a little timeline um, of the Trump presidency and its relation to Israel that may suggest why the Palestinians would be a little skeptical. <laughs> All right. Um, and then I, I have a question for you at the end, which is essentially what the peace plan is, and see if you would agree. Okay. All right. So first off, this little timeline. Um, in December 2017, uh, the Trump administration recognized Jerusalem as the undivided capital of the Jewish state of Israel. Remember that. Yes. Um, this was a big deal because uh, the, the Palestinians still see a divided Jerusalem as 
potentially being the capital of a future Palestinian state and a, and a Jewish state. Yeah. Um, if you go with a two-state solution, they That's want... That's how it works. Yeah, part of Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. Which only seems fair. I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know. I mean, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, we're, so we're going to do a podcast maybe next week. I, I've been researching the um, Israeli-Palestinian history for like a month and a half now. So oh, really? we're going to have like a real podcast. I've, I've probably got like, it might have to be multiple po- podcasts because I swear I've got two hours of material already. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, so moving on with this little timeline, to try and keep it short on right. this podcast. On this one. Uh, then May and tw- May of 2018, um, the U.S. Embassy opened in Jerusalem. Yeah. And that just affirmed the no longer divided Jerusalem. Like, this um, is not on the table anymore. Exactly, and that's the point of yeah. all of this. That's yeah. the important point of all of this. Yeah. Um, so then August 18, uh, the U.S. ended all funding to the U.N. for the Palestinian refugees. These are the people that were kicked out of uh, Israel um, during the Nakba and afterwards in 1948 when um, the Israeli... Uh, the Jewish state forcibly removed like over a hundred thousand Palestinians. Um, and yeah. they fled to various neighboring countries, um, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, so the U S had provided a significant amount of funding to the UN's group that was helping support these. Cause they're still living in refugee camps. This is 75 years later or whatever. Wow. Um, wait, how, how much later is it? 70 years later? I don't know. Do my math for me. Right, se- you, se- know, you know better than yeah, asking me true. to do that. 72 years later, something like that. Anyway, um, it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah. Like a long multi- while. Multi-generations at this point. Yeah. And they're still living in refugee camps, a lot of these people. Wow. Um, so uh, the U.S. provided a significant amount of funding to the U.N.'s group that was helping support them, um, and they cut it off. And that was about six months after they had uh, the U.S. had um, severely cut uh, their funding to the program. All right. Hmm. Um, in September of 2018, this is like back to back to back to back, right? Yeah. Um, the uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, their mission in D.C. that they formed there after the Oslo Accords that um, was a reasonable agreement that the uh, Israeli state never actually followed through on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization mission um, was forcibly closed in D.C., uh, according to Bolton, as punishment um, for like lack of negotiation with the Israeli state or something like that. Really? I mean, but like you have this situation where they're, you know, they're not. It's not really a negotiation because yeah. you keep taking things off the table. It, yeah. It's you're trying to force well, them into an agreement that they don't want to be a part of. A, a negotiation works both ways. Exactly. I mean, that's, it's a give and take. It's not a, just a take. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, in February of 2019, uh, USAID USAID um, ended its funding for the Palestinian Authority. They provided uh, some um, relief to the Palestinian Authority in the uh, occupied territories in Israel. The Palestinian um, territories in Israel. Yeah. Not anymore. Yeah. Uh, in March of 2019, um, Trump recognized the Golan Heights as, uh, as part of Israel. Yep. This was a territory that was, um, occupied in 1967 from Syria, it was Syrian territory that was occupied by the Israelis and annexed in 1981, yeah. uh, against international law. Um, Trump's statement that it's now part of Israel doesn't make it so. Uh, it, it's still against international law. It does when you have the biggest army in the world. I guess. If, if you are the enforcement organization for the UN, it doesn't really matter what the UN's international laws are. Exactly. Um, and that's maybe a, a point that we can spend a lot of time on some other time. <laughs> um, in June of 2019, uh, the economic part of the deal of the century was revealed. Uh, there was Palestinian involvement up till that point. Really? Um, and essentially the plan said, well, all you need is money. You don't need anything else. Oh yeah. At, at which point the Palestinians said, this is a joke. We're going home. Yeah. <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and they haven't been part of the process since then. Yeah. Um, so, and it makes you wonder why even continue the process at that point? 
Like, I mean, if, if both sides aren't, like, represented, there's no way we're ever coming to an agreement here. Because the U.S. government is only concerned with one side anyway. Well, obviously. But I'm just saying, like, I mean, and that's the reason it continues. But, like I said, I mean, in, in, in the real world, you mm-hmm. would never continue a negotiation with just one side. Well, it's a big show for the rest of the world, and it, in the end, when you have the deal that was revealed... Um, yeah. Tuesday or whenever that was, uh, you have that situation that I mentioned at the beginning where you can say, well, these people, they've been given a perfectly good deal and they just refuse to agree to anything. Yeah. Uh, they're just being stubborn. There's no, there's no sense in even trying. But it goes back to the whole deal of it's just a big show, just the same way with the mm-hmm. impeachment. It's, it's all just a big show. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no real substance to any of this. Right. Well, and then in November, 2019 in convent, uh, contravention of international law, um, the U.S. government re- recognized the Israeli settlements in the occupied territories as being legal. Really? And again... I may have missed that. Just because the U.S. says yeah. so doesn't make it so. Yeah. Um, it, it is clearly in violation of international law. You're not allowed to relocate and settle your people in occupied territories. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, this, is a, this is part of the U.N. agreement in order to prevent war in the future. If you can't take territory by conquest, it's supposed to be um, so taking reason, away an incentive to go to war. Well, it's the reason we didn't own Iraq after we took over Iraq. Well, I who mean, says? <laughs> well, I mean, the according to the uh, United Nations, they say. Yeah. But, I mean, technically, I mean, we took it, but... I mean, not like we'd want it anyway. But <laughs> I don't know. We're still there. We're still there. I mean, we, we never left, so... Just it just raises a question, yeah. you know. I mean, well, finally, January twenty twenty, the peace plan was revealed to uh, at the White House yeah. um, through two meetings, one between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, President Trump, and yeah. the other between President Trump and Benny Gantz, yeah. who is Benjamin Netanyahu's also Israeli rival. It's. It's amazing it, that no could, Palestinians invited. Would, There's people missing. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's amazing they couldn't find some Palestinian stooge to at least come over there and like be part of this. Yeah. Like, th- there's no effort. It, to me, that seems there's no effort made at all to make it seem legitimate. No, I, I don't think that. And to anybody that's paying was. attention, but it goes back to what we always talk about: the they're assuming that you're not paying attention and that you're you're just looking at this at face values. Oh, well, they're just the media said they're just not involved they're just turn, shooing away this good deal and you know well and israel has a powerful lobby and they fund a lot of media yeah. here in the in the u.s oh absolutely and if you haven't i know i've plugged this before but um if you haven't seen the lobby usa it's long it's like four one hour parts but yeah. you can find it on youtube or at uh was it electronic intifada Oh, I don't know. I've never I heard of that. Um, anyway, uh, you can find it. Just search for there. the Lobby yeah. USA. Yeah. Um, YouTube, it's definitely available on YouTube. And uh, just watch the four parts. It's like four hours of watching, but it is... Maybe it's more than that. Or is it... Maybe it's four two-hour parts. I can't oh, remember. Wow. <laughs> anyway, it's it's really long, but it's some of the the best undercover reporting um, that yeah. I've that I've seen. Really? Um, if it, if the subject wasn't the subject that it is, there probably would have been some prizes awarded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it is absolutely fascinating, yeah. um, how deeply involved, uh, the Israel lobby is in, uh, with government in the United States. Yeah. Um, and so here, the peace plan was revealed. And so this is my question to you, cause this is essentially what the peace plan, uh, from the Palestinian perspective is. Yeah. Um, how about you stay in prison for the rest of your life, but I will give you millions of dollars? <laughs> yeah, it ain't going to work out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... We're, we're going to keep fighting. I'm <laughs> sorry. Like, we're, we're, this, this isn't going to work for me. <laughs> it's not much of a fight, honestly. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, random uh, Palestinians lobbing some rockets across the... Is it a border? What is it? What, uh, yeah. You know, um, is not quite... The, yeah. Not it's not it's we're, not a fair we're, fight. We're, we're not gonna we're not gonna have peace. How yeah. about that? <laughs> this is definitely a David and Goliath thing, but uh, but yeah. the Israelis are the Goliath in this case. Yeah. Right. Um, um, anyway, still not gonna that, still not gonna have peace. Yeah, that's essentially what the deal is, though. It's um, you will 
<laughs> you will give up your sovereignty. Uh, you'll give up what little liberty you have. Um, you will give up any hope of a two-state solution or becoming a citizen of Israel proper. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we'll invest billions of dollars for economic development. And right. that's, you know, it's like they have no awareness that maybe the occupation and the the just the general um, condition that the Palestinians are are kept in in the occupied territories yeah. might have a negative impact on their uh, economy. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. it, like the idea is that you could just put money into it and it will all develop just fine, but. Yeah. I think there are other factors. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we all know better than that. Yeah. Um, so so I, I've got at least one friend that I don't know if, if they're listening or not, but this is probably the last podcast they'll listen to if it's, <laughs> if, if they are. Wow. Um, I mean, and just wait until I get to the real story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait till we do a whole podcast on this, yeah. right? Well, um, it just has to be give and take on both sides. And anytime yeah. you have a negotiation like this, I mean, that's really my take. Yeah. Well, and that's the problem. It wasn't really a negotiation. Yeah. Um, and the, the U S made it clear, uh, through all these actions leading up to this, whose side they were on, where they were at on that. And, yeah. um, and those actions like, uh, you know, recognizing Jerusalem, moving the embassy, recognizing the Golan Heights, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are, are a way of taking, um, what was potentially bargaining points off the table. Yeah. Um, and it was all in one direction. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, it created a situation where uh, what they're expecting is that the Palestinians will agree to a bunch of money and nothing yeah. and, and having really nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, economic investment it just doesn't make up for all these other things that are, that are important to them. Oh, absolutely. Um, but they took those things away from the negotiation to begin with. And you, you kind of got to figure like the economic stuff is probably the le bottom of the list of what they want anyway. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, they would like, um, you know, uh, as much food as they're willing to buy to cross the border. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. that, that would be a step <laughs> in the right direction. So, yeah. um, anyway, so that's that. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm, I do want to go into some detail about like the history of this conflict um, in the future. Maybe next week, maybe the week after. It's hard to say. It kind of depends on what happens. It's like when we run into uh, positions where there's not any real news. Yeah. Well, any real domestic news to, that's worth talking about. Yeah. I mean, there probably is. It's just not getting any coverage. And I look in some weird places, but I still don't. Yeah. You know. Well. I've been kind of tied up lately, but I've been trying to keep my ear down, and I haven't yeah. heard much. So I tend to focus on foreign policy stuff. So I, yeah, <laughs> I, I miss some. I miss some yeah. domestic things from time to time. Domestic's um, really more my corner, anyway. I'm, to, I'm more interested in domestic personally. Yeah, far. I mean, and I, I understand I, why. Yeah, I mean, and I'm interested in the foreign policy stuff, and it's not that I don't follow it. It's just the, the domestic stuff intrigues me more. Well, um. It, it seems at least on the surface to have more direct influence on your life. Yeah. But I, I maintain at this point that foreign policy has a tremendous impact on, and on, on our lives here. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I don't disagree with and that I, at all. And I think it is the most important issue. Um, it's the biggest waste in the U.S. government. Uh, it literally, By far. <laughs> literally a quarter of everything you send to the government goes to foreign policy stuff. More than that. Actually. And it's literally just money being blown up in another side of the world. Yeah. Like literally <laughs> like we're blowing up money over there. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in terms of domestic stuff, uh, we used to have, um, some listeners that would frequently send uh, articles and stuff. Uh, say, hey, you should talk about this. You should talk about that. Maybe we selected yeah. the wrong ones or something. I, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not really getting any of that anymore. And yeah. I like it. So if you guys, if you're one of those people out there, or if you've ever thought, hey, you know, I should send them this article, and maybe they would be interested in covering it. Do please do. Yeah, yeah. I'm always can't keep for up stuff with everything. Like I have limited time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So I guess we'll wrap up with that. So uh, as always, um, follow us on Facebook. And subscribe on iTunes and Podbean. Uh, like and share. Um, comments. Uh, what else? Is there other stuff? I think that's uh, that's pretty well it. Okay. That's everywhere we're at. Well, um, we expect to be back in a week when we finally get this right. 
Uh, until next time, try and stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.